Good morning. Good morning. I was saying to someone earlier, I like August more than July. It's still summer, but the evenings are a little cooler and much more tolerable. And it's about a beautiful Sunday morning. Good to see you all. Um, we're going to start with uh, head number 336. I hope it's in the Lord that you would stand as we sing.
and get it back that thou now in prayer. Father, we give thanks that you would open our eyes that we might see Jesus. We see too much of the world, what's going on about us, and all the confusion. May we see you in your glory. And do that which we glorify you with in Christ's name. Amen. We're in Acts chapter 10 this week. We're doing this series of three famous people that came to know the Lord. In Acts 8, we have the Ethiopian. It was a treasure, great abundance. He was reading the Bible verses. He did not understand. In chapter 9, we have Saul of Tarsus. He knew the Bible, but misunderstood. One man did not understand. One man understood, misunderstood. And now the guy today, he didn't know anything. So we have three different people, Ethiopian, Africa. There's been a great church in Africa for 2,000 years. I assume this man went home and evangelized his region. The church in Ethiopia has been famous. In the last 10 years, they've suffered lots of persecution. Beheadings. So there are great Christians in Ethiopia from Acts chapter 8. Nine, Apostle Saul, Paul. We have the epistles of Paul and all, all that contact. Today, we have a man from Italy, Europe. So we're going to look at conversion of Cornelius. Verse before his conversion. When we look at these verses 1 through 8. We see in verse 1, a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of a band called the Italian band. It's always interesting when my wife and I are reading through the Bible and we see a place where we visited. We've been in Caesarea. They have a big viaduct that comes off the mountain and there's big arches. I don't know who the guy is, but there's a picture of American tourists holding that up. <laughs> I can picture it. Still there, so I guess I'll hold it pretty good. So we're aware of Caesarea would be northwest of Jerusalem. It was a centurion, which means he had a hundred people under his control. Now that's going to be important because later on, the man who controls others took advice from the Lord. But then in verse 2, we read the religion of Cornelius. A devout man, one that feared God with all his house. He gave alms to the people. He prayed to the Lord always. Every sermon that I preach, I always have two concerns. Number yeah. one, when you're up here and you say, thus saith the Lord, you get the quote correct. Do you folks appreciate when someone misquotes you? And you say, what? That's not what I said. We don't like to be misquoted. But we also agree that most misquotes don't make you look better. <laughs> Is there a tendency? It should be half better half worse, but most misquotes get you in trouble. I wonder how many preachers a day standing behind a desk are not telling what God says. I know one, because at the funeral, the person quoted part of John 14, 6. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. That's not all the verse, is it? No man comes to the Father but by me. So I assume if the minister misquotes it at a funeral, he must misquote it in church. So it's always important to me that I'm giving you exactly what God says. God's word. Frizzleburg Bible Church. We want to make sure we get it right. Vacation Bible School. So that's the number one concern, that we're always correct about what the Bible says, what the Lord says. My second concern, and that deals with verse 2, is that people could accept what I say, but have never accepted the Lord. 
Salvation is a relationship, not a religion. And so there'll be people that would appreciate my message, but they've never been saved. They've come to church, but they've never made that relationship with Jesus Christ. If I ask you, are you married? You say, I'm in love. Not the same. Legally, marriage is a relationship, right? Recorded in some courthouse somewhere that so-and-so and so-and-so -so got married. Now, it's great to be married and in love, as I am. So that's great too, but that doesn't make you married. Marriage is a relationship. Salvation is a relationship. And I've been concerned over the years that people would come to our churches, they would hear the sermons, but they've never really asked Christ to be their Savior. So when you read verse 2, that looks like the kind of person we like to have here in Frizzle Word Bible Church, wouldn't we? But at this point, he's not saved. Note a couple things. He's devout. That means he's reverent. He has a pious attitude. He feared God. He had respect for the Lord. Are we seeing in America more and more disrespect for the Lord? They don't care what God says. They don't care what God does. I had a politician last week that made the statement, these guys, they, they don't believe in evolution. Yes! I don't believe in evolution. I believe in the Creator. So, of course, they've also called us deplorable, so what's, what's, what's new? But he feared God. He feared what the Lord said. It says he gave alms. He gave, he was generous. He gave gifts. He helped people. That's great. He was generous. Probably a stingy Christian is a, is a contradiction. Because God so loved the world that he gave the only begotten son. So we give. Why? Because we've been so blessed for the Lord to give. And he prayed. There are two Greek words for prayer. One is for prayer in general. The other word is pray for definite needs. Like we're praying for the sick. Uh, Ruth Grable, I don't know, did he come from here or somewhere? She had <coughs> colon surgery within the last day or so. I don't know if you folks knew that. I don't know where I don't know where I got it from Judy. I guess I did. I probably got it from Ann Benneker. Did you folks get Ann Benneker's? I'm just asking. Does she send me down to you? She keeps me up on what's going on in the Fellowship Bible Church. So we're praying for Ruth's surgery and for Pastor Andrew's father. So that's a particular need. We don't say, Lord bless all the missionaries. You pray for them by name. So he was very precise in his prayers. But at this point, he doesn't know the Lord. A religious guy, but he doesn't have that relationship. So, Verses 3 through 8, revelation from the Lord. He saw the vision about the ninth hour, which would be 3 p.m. of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying, Cornelius. And when he looked at him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? What do you want? He said unto him, Your prayers and your alms are come up for a mortal before God. God does take note. God knows what's going on. When you get the thought that God doesn't hear my prayer, who's telling you that? Your prayer is heard. And I, over the years, uh, there have been times when people thought, if, if they were praying to the Lord, and then I started praying, that God will put them on hold and take my call. It doesn't work that way. Come boldly to the throne of grace is for everyone. And I look back over the, my years of ministries, and I've had some great prayer warriors. Grandma Carter was one of them. Well, that's pastor of my wife's home church. And she had lots of health problems and couldn't sleep at night. So one time I'd say, Grandma, 
Carter, what do you do when you can't sleep at night? Should I pray for you? I wonder, looking back now, there were things in that church at that time that were really moving to the Lord. Because I'm a graduate of Washington Bible College at Capital Bible Seminary, and I got my theology together. It may not have been that. It may have been Grandma Carter's prayers. When I get to heaven, God said, it wasn't you. You just didn't mess it up. It was Grandma Carter's faithful prayers. So God does hear these things. Verse 5 then. Now, send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He will tell you what you ought to do. Now, when I look at this, here is a man that's in command. He's got a hundred guys on him. When he says, do it, they do it. And God says, you're going to take command from somebody else. Can you, can you take advice from someone else? Or are any of us in, in the place where we know everything and we don't need anybody to tell us anything? Well, here's a man who's famous. He said, call this fellow Peter. He'll tell you what to do. Verses 7 and 8. And when the angel which was spoke to Cornelius was departed, he called to his household servants, <clears throat> devout soldier with them that waited on him continually. And when he declared these things, he sent them to Joppa. He didn't mess around. He didn't wait around. When God speaks to us, we should respond. Is that true of our children? Our children are growing up. When I tell Steve, Steve, you need to clean your room. Not within the next month. Within the next 24 hours. And as time would go along, I would say, Steve, we are going to clean your room in one hour. I only did it one time because how I cleaned it was not to help for the him. My shoes here, a sock was there. I, I cleaned out the room all right. But you tell the children, do something, you want them to, to do it. Isn't that true, God? When God speaks to us, we should obey. He didn't wait around. He was instantly obeying the Lord. Now, for a scripture reference, verses 9 through 23 tells about Peter. So he sent, he did all he could do. But then verses 9 through 23, the Bible tells us what happened. It's interesting, in chapter 8, God told Philip, go down to the wilderness and talk to God. He went right away. When Saul got saved, Jesus took care of himself, didn't he? Jesus appeared and said, I'll take care of this guy. Saul, Saul, why persecutes thou me? Well, in this case, they said, go and get Peter. And now we're going to have all these verses getting Peter ready to go. God is sending a missionary, but you've got to get him ready. I've known some people that God let them fail a little bit. Their ideas didn't work out. They turned to the Lord. So here is Peter uh, in this house. He was on the housetop. He was praying. Isn't this nice? He's praying, but he's reluctant to do what God's telling him to do. God says, I want you to go. And he's a little on the reluctant side. Are you like, God speaks to you and says, well, I don't know if I'm going to do that. What other option do you have? I look back to April 1958 when the Lord called me into the ministry. I realized right then my life would never again be the same. If I obeyed the Lord, I couldn't imagine what the blessings were now. Imagining I'm getting to see. If I disobeyed the Lord, I'd be miserable the rest of my life. And I've had people in our ministry. And God spoke to him and they didn't do it and they were miserable. So God is speaking to Peter, but he's got to get him ready. Verse 10, he was very hungry, he would have eaten, 
But uh, he fell into a trance, and then we have this great big sheet coming down from heaven. It says, with um, four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creepy things, fowl in the air. I gotta believe there was an earthly calendar somewhere. Gotta be a home somewhere. We gotta have sausage and ham, and we gotta do these things. Now, fowl, I don't know if it was turkey, what it was. But these animals came down, and he's looking at it, and God says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord. No. You ever read the Bible about the not so, Lord? Doesn't go very well, does it? When God speaks to us and says, Not so, Lord. Hello? You mean God's not so, Lord? For I've never eaten anything that's common or unclean. And God said, What I have cleansed, that call not thou common. God said, I've got a bigger calling for you. And while this was done three times, you kind of get the idea. I wonder if Peter thought back. Didn't Jesus ask him three times, Simon, what was thou me? Now, I don't know whether Peter is a slow learner or God really wants to drill into it. Either way, the vessels received back he doubted in verse 17. Can you imagine this? Peter, he's hungry. You were dream, and in your dream, you're having a banquet, and you get away, and there's no food anywhere near. You're thirsty. So that's how he doubted himself. What should this mean? Why did God do this? We have these men knocking at the door. He's upstairs. What, decide what's this about? What's this knocking at the door? Oh, how do you know it? Oh, we're from Cornelius. Could you come with us? Oh, wait a minute. Cornelius is a Gentile. Peter's a Jew. And so God is telling him, I want you to go and visit Taliban. I want you to go to visit Al Qaeda. I want you to go to Afghanistan and Iran. Are you serious? You really want us to do that? The call of God? When I was in college, one of our, my classmates was an older lady. And she had a bird for the Nazis that had an establishment in the D.C. area back in the 50s. So she's going to witness to the Nazis, and we're all saying, you're going to do what? They had this compound in northern Virginia with great Dane dogs as guards. You say, Ruby, they're going to eat you alive. But she went in there. I think she was so non-threatening, she was able to win. She had a burden for these people. She thought the Nazis, they need Jesus. Well, yeah, I don't want to get shot. I don't want to get eaten by a great big dog. And she had a great impact on that community. So here is Peter, and these are Gentiles. Well, wait a minute. He just had a vision from God. So he goes along, and the rest of the story says how he goes along. I'll take you down to verse 24. And that is Cornelius in his conversion. But first point, respect for God's messenger. On the morrow after they entered Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them. That means wait with great expectation. Over the years, in many people to the Lord, in my first pastorate, my evaluation was, I won a lot of arguments, but I didn't win a lot of people. There is a difference. Here, he was waiting. I, I, I had a pastor friend of mine that was a great soul winner. And had a pleasant, good church over the word Elk, Elkton in that area. I asked him one time, what is your key? He said, I get up in the morning, and I pray that God would lead me to someone that's hungry for the Lord. Well, that didn't seem too bad. I'm looking for somebody to wrestle with. He's looking for someone that's willing to accept the Lord. So he's waiting for what is going to be said to him in verse 24. He had waited and he called together his kinsmen near friends. He got his friends together. Isn't that great when, when you talk and they want their friends to hear what's going to go on? 
In verse 25, Peter coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down on his feet and worshipped him. Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am but a man. Now, I appreciate what, when people respect a minister. Doesn't get you to heaven. I've had people, they found who it was, slam the door. Back in the 80s and 90s, it was a lot safer. In our area, I did a lot of visitation. And then it got so, uh, I've never walked dark, but it got a little more dangerous. But there would be people that would slam the door if I knew from the church. One guy even said to me, why don't you mind your own business? And I said, this is my business. <laughs> to tell you about Jesus. If you come to church, I won't have to come knock on your door. That wasn't well received, but <laughs> I understand people get angry at preachers. <coughs> they get angry at Christians. Have you ever just maybe mentioned something about the Lord and people get angry at you? Oh, you always talk about religion. Always talk about God. No, there was respect for um, Peter, but it's not us. You can accept me but it won't get you to heaven. The Bible doesn't say you accept the pastor and you get to heaven. It says you accept Jesus. As many as receive him. Who's the him? Jesus. Not the preacher. But at least there was this respect. So it's interesting. Peter in verse 27 to 29, he has to explain why it was difficult for him to come here. That's a funny way to start witnessing. Uh, well, I should. I don't feel I shouldn't be here. I don't know, my upbringing wouldn't bring me here. But he explains why he had a hard time coming. And then Cornelius explains, starting in verse 30, what happened to him about the vision and so forth. So we'll go down to verse 36, verse 34. After they both explain, Peter explained why he did come, difficult. Cornelius explained why he was praying, but he's not saved. Doesn't know the Lord yet. Verse 34, the reception of the gospel message. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of the truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. We were listening to a message on the radio here this morning. The minister was talking about prejudice. And we draw conclusions about people before we know the facts. Isn't that great? When someone wants to accept Christ, no one accepts that. They may be in prison. I think you have a prison ministry over here, and people in prison can accept the Lord. One of my associates uh, moved to Florida. His employment was Disney, um, but he had home Bible studies, was able to get in prison, because it's by the mail, and no pun intended, but they have time on their hands. So Daryl was able to get a lot of people come to know the Lord in prison, and then they get somebody else, and so the prison ministries, uh, they're coming to know the Lord, and uh, that's, that's great. So God is no respected person. You call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Whosoever. Now, when people are selling you something, they've always got a bit of credit score. You go buy a car, probably have a credit reference. You go buy a house, before you, you have to have a credit reference. Isn't it great you don't need a credit reference? You witness to someone, it doesn't matter their history. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 35, then, he talks about God's no respecter, but in every nation, he that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. It's interesting in witnessing. We, always, we don't always know people's hearts. God knows people's hearts. I had a visiting a family when I was in Pastor Grace Memorial Church, and I led them to the Lord. They prayed the sinner's prayer, all that. And I was excited when went to the Lord. And their neighbors came to the church. So the next Sunday, uh, they weren't in church, but the neighbors came. And I said, I was 
Uh, it's busy. There yeah. was last week. Let them do the Lord. There were comment boys. That preacher was pushing. That doesn't sound too good, does it? That preacher is pushing. What we call that is they gave a pastoral yes. They're willing to repeat anything I would say. If I asked them to repeat the Pledge of Allegiance, they would have done it. Half the Constitution, anything they would say, anything to get that guy out of the house. Were they saved? If they prayed that prayer to me, are they saved? Oh, no. you've got to pray to the Lord. So Peter is saying to accept of the Lord, you have to have a heart toward the Lord. And so he knew that this man was sincere thus far, and so what he would tell him would lead him further. Verse 43 talks about it. Further, further on. To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. So I'm always concerned about people that they're making this decision with the Lord. We had a lady in our town at that time that we would call her Captain Drunk. There was some family tragedy in the past that happened in January. It was every January, almost the month of January, this woman was drunk for a month. In the community, her daughter came to church. Every time she got drunk, she wanted to get saved. So I'd go over and I would plan the salvation with her. I would talk with her. I would pray with her. And nothing happened. I, it, it, it happened year after year after year. One time, here we go again. She's drunk. She called me. I went over. We did the same routine I've done all these years. Yeah. Sunday morning, she's in church, sober. Never drank again, except to the Lord. And what happened? One time, she must have gotten serious with the Lord. And I tell you, I was tempted not to go. Who was tempting me not to go? The devil. And uh, that lady lived for the Lord the rest of her life. It was a great testimony. So you never know when you're witnessing whether people are agreeing with you or agreeing with God, but the word does not return void. So here we have, whoever believes on him, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's important that we have that relationship with the Lord and we call upon him. We realize we're a sinner. We confess that to the Lord. We confess that sin carries a death penalty, that Christ died for us that Christ arose again, and we call on the name of the Lord. Sometimes people can go to a Bible-believing church and live like this man was living first, and people assume, because they go to church the same, that part happened with my wife. Uh, she grew up in a family that did not go to a Bible-believing church. Then she had two friends in the community, two girls, two friends, still living. And we still contact with them. So they got Jackie to go to church. Then they quit. But Jackie kept on going. And then kept on memorizing scripture. And my, my wife, as a teenager, lived so much like a Christian. No one ever checked with her. Did you ever receive Jesus as your Savior? It was later on, through other circumstances, where she accepted the Lord as a Savior. The word is not a turn point. But let's not assume because they pray, they do this, they do that. They are Christians. There are a lot of people who they know. Maybe more religious than us, but not that relationship with Jesus. So I'm just pressing a little bit. Make sure you have that relationship with Christ. If you don't have that, you can pray a sinner in prayer and just ask the Lord to save you from your sins, accept him as your savior, and you can be born again. Then down in verses 40, 8, 44 through the end of the chapter, we have Cornelius after his conversion. How do we know that this worked? While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on them, which heard the word. I like this one. Peter was still talking. I was already saying. 
Sometimes we don't realize what God has done in people's hearts. Even the circumcision which believe were astonished. Maybe you're astonished that certain people can be saved. Maybe you know someone you think, oh, God will never get saved. Don't say never. God can work in their hearts. Verse 46, when you heard the word of spoken tongues in that day, the magnified God. Then how do we know they're saved? One well, indication. Peter said, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? He commanded them to be baptized. Isn't it interesting? The Ethiopian going along, and finally he says, Here's water, can I have a baptismal service? Yes. The Apostle Paul went to Ananias and was baptized. So baptismal services, I think, are important. It's identification with Christ. We're buried with him in death. And as Christ was raised up, so we walk in newness of life. So baptism are great times of ministry. And in America, it may not have the meaning it has in other countries. When I was baptized, I went to the same school, same church, same family. But in some parts of the world, especially Islam, when you accept Christ, you have taken a break from family tradition. And it costs <coughs> people in other countries. When you're baptized, you're identified with Christ as that you renounce. I didn't have to read. thank the Lord as I look back. I didn't have to renounce anything. I was already in the Bible preaching church. Reverend Solomon, those local. Uh, I didn't have to renounce anything. But some have really had to pay a price. But here are those that identify with Christ. It says, uh, and then they pray to him that he would tarry a certain day. When people get saved, one of the first desires is the word of God. Didn't Peter say, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word. And I watched over the years when I've led people, led people through the Lord, even baptized. Let's see, are they going to continue on? Do you want to continue on growing in the Lord? If you have a tree and that tree doesn't continue to grow, or your tomatoes don't continue to grow, or your uh, zinnias continue to grow, or zucchini, one you smell and one you eat, you, you keep growing. As Christians, we want to keep growing. That's one of the Example we know, a person knows the Lord. They want to keep growing the Lord. And that's why we have Bible studies here. And the folks are walking with the Lord. I trust the Lord will encourage your hearts. We are looking at this series. Uh, next week, Lord willing, a Christian, a, a business lady accepting the Lord. And then the following week, a law enforcement person accepts the Lord. I'm looking at Eric on that one. A law enforcement person. I'm not good at yet. But in my mind, I'm looking somewhere doing a sermon. What happens if you don't accept the Lord? You know, Ethiopian did. Saul did. Cornelius did. It's just a matter of option. But the consequences to not accept the Lord. I trust each of you know the Lord. You have a personal relationship with the Savior. Let's bow now in prayer. Father, we give thanks for Cornelius, a uh, religious man, but then he got saved because he put his faith and trust in you. I trust that each one here today has that saving relationship with Christ as we pray his name.
has drawn us to you, some early in life, some later in life. We pray, Lord, that we have all then received what you have freely given, a life with you. We ask, Lord, that you would help us as we go forth to nurture that walk with you, to truly have more love for you, and that it be less of self and more of you. You must increase, and we must decrease. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.